Coming up on Market to Market, new leadership in the House Agriculture Committee looks ahead to the 117th Congress. In a year like few others, what stands out in 2020? And Market Analysis with Jeff French, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, January 1 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Happy New Year. As the metaphorical ball drops on 2021, it will be out with the old and in with the new. When the clock strikes 12 on January 3rd, the 116th Congress will be history. During the last hours of the session, the House passed another round of stimulus, but as of our taping Thursday afternoon, the call for $2,000 in direct payments was stalled in the Senate. By Wednesday, a new Congress will be sworn in, a runoff election for two U.S. Senate seats, which will determine the majority, and the Electoral College certification process occurs. The margin of majority is the slimmest since the 1940s and could foster cooperation in passing legislation. John Torpy reports on the optimism coming from the new ranking member of a committee focused on those providing food and fiber. When the 117th Congress gavels in January 3rd, the House Agriculture Committee's new minority ranking member will be in a familiar leadership role. With the retirement of Representative Mike Conaway of Texas, the Republican leadership on the House Agriculture Committee comes from the Keystone State. Glenn G.T. Thompson represents the 15th District of Pennsylvania and will become the ranking minority leader for the committee through 2023 goal for the Agriculture Committee is, is to restore a robust rural economy and, quite frankly, begin to regrow population-wise rural America. Because without a robust rural America, every American is going to wake up in the cold, dark, and hungry. I think, uh, Congressman uh, Thompson was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2008. He served as chair of House Ag subcommittees and vice chairman of the full House Ag Committee in the 115th Congress. Today, Certainly, my family lineage were, were mostly all dairy farmers. Um, uh, has really contributed to my, I think, my passion for agriculture. And so, so I understand the pressures and some insurmountable things that farmers come up against sometimes. Thompson notes his previous work on farm legislation helped set the stage for relief aid during the global pandemic. Uh, the last farm bill, I actually was the chairman of the subcommittee for nutrition. And so a lot of the things that we had to, we fell back on and were able to do for all these folks that were struggling, and many continuing to struggling today, uh, a lot of that came out of the uh, 2018 Farm Bill. Thompson says his experience in the House Ag Committee and a slim majority by the Democrats creates a better space for compromise in 2021 and beyond. So I'm really looking forward to working with the chairman um, he's a, a statesman, a gentleman. I've served with him on the committee and for, uh, well, this will be our 13th year together. together. And I think uh, it's interesting the margins are the smallest margin between parties since World War II. I think that that just creates great opportunity for us to continue to do what we've always done best in agriculture, and that is to work together for the benefit of, of the American families. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. COVID-19 will long be known as the dominant story of 2020. The virus impacted nearly everything in the world, including livelihoods in rural America. Those who provide food from gate to plate, it was a real-time audible in logistics to handle the changes in supply and demand. Peter Tubbs has our look back at the biggest stories of the 366 days of 2020. <laughs> The COVID-19 virus first emerged from Wuhan, China in December 2019 and was carried to nearly every corner of the globe in the following months. 
Various forms of lockdowns, travel bans, and restrictions were meant to flatten the curve, but they also slowed the global economy. Still in March, Congress and the White House approved billions of dollars in spending, both to combat the spread of the virus and assist in treating its victims, who required specialized techniques. The New York Stock Exchange dropped over 30 percent during a four-week fall in February and March. The restaurant industry took an immediate hit that lingered for months after. Dining rooms went dark, and less profitable takeout options emerged as curb service became the norm. Americans were now cooking for themselves, and the food supply chain tried to adjust in real time. Empty shelves appeared where some food staples were snapped up, in addition to cleaning supplies and toilet paper. Sales at the meat counter jumped 50 percent. Americans filled their freezers just as packing houses were forced to slow or stop their lines as COVID-19 outbreaks ran through slaughterhouses. More than 1,000 plants reported infections among their employees. Many packers canceled contracts on animals ready for delivery. Independent lockers absorbed some of the surplus, but prices for live cattle dropped even as demand for retail beef skyrocketed. Early in the outbreak, when restaurants were closing, we saw a run on beef in the grocery stores. And so actually box beef prices increased by a significant percentage. So that gap between what uh, the, the, the producers were seeing, which tended to follow the futures in terms of their prices and the box beef prices has been historically large. That price gap would lead to record profits for beef processors as the pandemic continued. Just in Iowa, we're, we're estimating that there's about 40,000 pigs per day that are, are not um, going to market that should be. The reality is it's just a drop in the bucket compared to the magnitude of the backlog that we're generating here. Dairy producers were forced to dump milk as processors lowered buying for places like schools that were suddenly closed. We have sent a notice out to our farmers that we're looking for a 7% drop in milk by April 15th. We have cranked up our plants to 100%. After April 15th, we'll probably have to start dumping some milk. Some produce was left in the field, as it had no buyer. I want to be clear. The bare store shelves that you may see in some cities in the country are a demand issue, not a supply issue. An April congressional relief bill sent $16 billion in direct payments to producers and another $2 billion to buy up excess farm products for food banks. The shift of school locations from buildings to bedrooms prompted districts to provide drive-up meals for children who qualify for free and reduced meals that were unintentionally cut off from some of the only food they received during the day. 23 million Americans found themselves unemployed, spiking demand at the nation's food banks. Yeah, we've been uh, seeing our clientele go up in the past week, and our volunteers have been staying home because of the coronavirus. By August, the economy would need another round of relief spending from Congress. Despite trade disruptions ahead of and in 2020, farm incomes are predicted to grow by 22 percent from 2019 levels to reach $102 billion. According to data from the consulting firm Agricultural Economic Insights, direct farm payments will make up 36 percent of net farm income in 2020. A third wave of COVID-19 infections in the fall spread through the Midwest and rural states, areas which had largely avoided broad infections and deaths. As of late December, North and South Dakota had a COVID fatality rate similar to New York and New Jersey, states which suffered early in the pandemic. COVID-19 stole momentum from an American economy that was accelerating as it began the year and looked to improve after the signing of the USMCA trade agreement in January. After nearly two years of posturing and tit-for-tat tariff hikes, the United States and China signed phase one of a trade deal. The trade pact put a pause on the boiling struggle of issues between the two countries. This is a mutually beneficial and win-win agreement. It will bring about stable economic growth, promote world peace and prosperity, and is in the interest of the producers, consumers, and investors in both countries. The agreement required China to purchase $40 billion in American agricultural goods in 2020 and 2021. 
As the year drew to a close, China was not on pace to meet their 2020 purchasing goal. Like most years, a weather event left a path of destruction. In August, a storm packing triple digit wind speeds laid waste to Iowa's corn crop. The derecho, or straight line windstorm, leveled what was expected to be a record crop with winds topping 100 miles per hour. An estimated 10 million acres were damaged or destroyed in five states along a 770 mile path. The damage is widespread and the damage is real. Uh, I've walked in fields that are absolutely laying flat. I've walked in fields that are half flat and uh, uh, corn is leaning over. It Harvest is going to be a, a great challenge for folks. Hurricane season brought 30 total storms with an extraordinary 12 U.S. landfalls during the busiest hurricane season on record. Combined damages were estimated at over $45 billion. While the southeast was pummeled with hurricane-driven rain, the western half of the country slid deeper into drought. The lack of moisture helped fuel massive wildfires across the west, burning over 8 million acres. The political winds shifted against the White House in November as Joe Biden won the popular vote by 8 million votes and by 74 electoral votes. The former vice president selected former USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack for another term in the same office. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market report. We are producing this program on Thursday as the final days of 2020 were anything but calm as corn closed higher the last 14 trading days. March wheat gained 14 cents while the nearby corn contract skyrocketed 33 cents or 7 percent. Beans in the teens occurred on Wednesday as a motion appeared to eclipse fundamentals. Nearby soybeans jumped 47 cents. March soybean meal went up 15.30 per ton. March cotton expanded $1.92 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, January class three milk futures lost 83 cents or 5%. A mixed week in the livestock sector. February cattle moved a nickel higher. March feeders dropped 207. And the February lean hog contract added 333. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index weakened 32 ticks. February crude oil added 12 cents per barrel. Comex gold gained 17.30 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index improved nearly three points to finish at 407 even. Now here to provide insight is one of our regular market analysts, Jeff French. Jeff, good to see you. Happy New Year to you. Great to be here, Paul. Thank you. So about Tuesday, Wednesday, the sentiment with wheat was going to be What about me? What about me? And then wheat just takes off on its own. Was that because uh, of a connection with corn and soybeans and the rally that they had had? Or is there something else going on in that market? Well, I I think, you know, it was, there was rains forecasted there Tuesday, uh, big rains. Well, it looked like it fell in mostly eastern Kansas, so we broke hard. Um, But it definitely was the third wheel uh, this week. Uh, Wheat did follow corn and beans. I think it was up 13 or 15 cents uh, on the week. Benefited from a, uh, a weaker U.S. dollar. Uh, the dollar's down here at a 32-month low. Uh, but you look at the wheat fundamentals. Uh, we did have some good exports, uh, but the domestic pipeline right now is uh, fully supplied. Uh, you know, we looked at wheat uh, this week, and we made some sales up here at five-year highs. Chicago is at six-year highs. Kansas City at one point this week, two-year highs. Minneapolis has had its own story. Is there one of those contracts that you, you said you'd made sales? Was there one that you, uh, of what's mentioned that you'd be making a sale right now? Yeah, we like the Chicago one. I mean, it, the stocks are the lowest there, and uh, uh, we like that six-year high, uh, and that's where we made the sales. But, you know, the Kansas City, you know, a lot of interest there in selling that too as well because uh, there are some places that are dry. I mean, the wheat went into dormancy at, you know, seven-year lows, but there's also some good wheat out there. So I think you got to look at it if it's profitable for you. Uh, use the rally, um, get some fo- sold if you got a good basis. If not, look at some downside protection at these levels. When does the weather become the big story in wheat? You know, I think it's, you know, always going to be a story. But, you know, if we can get some moisture here in the next month, help it out, um, and then we get into the spring, we'll see where that goes right now. But, uh, uh, you know, we'll see what it brings up here in the next couple of months. 
you're supposed to have a very calm end of December. 14 straight days going up for corn. You ever seen anything like that? It's unprecedented. Uh, corn, wheat, and beans made their highs for the year during the last week of December. It's never happened uh, in the history. Uh, 14 days higher in the corn market, that's the longest winning streak since 1959. So uh, 2020, it's going out with a bang and it's gonna be remembered for many different things, uh, but it's also gonna be remembered in the agricultural markets. Is there one particular storyline that led to that history making event, that you, the trifecta? Well, I think it's um, a combination of just the funds get long. I, I mean, we were down in the dumps, you know, for four or five months uh, with the trade war, with the virus, but then we saw, you know, China come back and they've been back here for the last two or three months, um, you know, bringing these prices higher. Uh, U.S. dollar lower, that's helping out. Um, but yeah, this is unseasonable uh, to rally like we have here during, the, during harvest and then during the winter. And uh, we'll see what 21 brings. All right, so you have two ridiculously hard questions to answer tonight. The first one is this. How much higher does corn go in oh, we'll the next, it, let's say the next month? Oh, we'll see. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's overbought. Um, there is a gap on the March contract up there at 505. If you look at the continuous chart, uh, we might go and try to fill that. Uh, also, there's um, some resistance up at the 522 area. Uh, can we go see there? Uh, we'll have to see. The funds are along 350,000 contracts. Uh, that is, you know, if you look at historically, that's very high. They've been long 407,000 contracts before back in 2011, so maybe they continue to add to that. Um, but I think, you know, we go in here to a three-day weekend, uh, you know, we kind of calm down, we see what Monday brings. If we can close higher on Monday, new contract highs, I think that would be a very good sign. We'll talk about Argentina in the corn market in Market Plus, but let's start with Argentina in the soybean market right now. The strike uh, in the soybean area uh, resolution reached on Wednesday, but the market didn't really seem to, to use that as a factor to slow any rally. Was there something else? Well, I mean, it's still going to be a week before they get the product out there. Um, but you look at what is going on in the world. I mean, China right now has all-time high meal prices, $516 a ton. So they're scrambling. Um, you know, what we got to look at now is the product that we have got purchased from the U.S. here in the last two weeks because of the uh, strike down in Argentina. Do we see cancellations? Uh, you know, that's going to be on everybody's mind. Uh, but products are short. You know, maybe these countries need them. We'll have to see. But uh, uh, what a good way to fill, you know, end up on the year there. In the look back piece that we just did, we talked a lot about the, the look back. One thing that could have been, could have been in there was this about corn and soybeans. Uh, corn in April was $3.00. Corn, uh, beans in April, 808. Corn has gone up 55%, beans have gone up 61%. That's before today, so those numbers are higher. The question on beans, where I gotta put your feet to the fire. Okay, we ran through 11, we ran through 12, we got to 13. Do I get to keep saying teens, beans in the teens for a while? And which team? I, I think it's gonna be tough. I, I mean, seasonally, uh, it's gonna be tough. Now. 1407 uh, is a pure Fibonacci, 62% retracement level. So uh, from the 2012 highs at 1794 to the 2019 lows at 790 a bushel, um, 1407 is a 62% retracement. We got the 50% retracement here yesterday at 1290, blew through that. Um, but I think it's gonna be uphill. I mean, uh, Brazil, gonna have beans ready here by the 1st of February. Uh, does China need to secure product for some quick ship beans here in the next two to three weeks? I think that will be telling. Or do they wait it out and, you know, wait for the Brazilian beans to be ready? Because Brazil still, I mean, it's been dry, but they're still getting some rains. I mean, it's not as dry as it is down in southern Brazil or Argentina. But most of the private forecasters still have the Brazilian crop at a record level, 130, 131 million metric tons. So they will have beans for export. Uh, it's just if China can, you know, wait the next five to six weeks to get those beans that are ready. All right, we get a lot of Twitter and Facebook questions, also some on Instagram. And this one uh, comes from Mitch in Hull, Iowa, in the northwest part of the state. He says the soybean corn price ratio has hovered in the 2.7 to 2.8 range. Historically, 2.5 
is more typical. What's your expectation on this on both current and new crop? Will corn move up to buy acres or can we expect a pullback on beans soon? So you look at new crop right now, uh, corn 430, beans 1110. The, the, the ratio was 2.56 to 1. Uh, I, I'm in the opinion that beans uh, for 21 need to gain at least 6 to 7.5 million acres. So I think personally uh, that ratio goes out to 2.75 to 2.8 to 1. So I think beans gain on corn here to, to secure those acres. Uh, you know, it's my opinion that we're going to plant 90 to 91 million acres of beans. So that would put the new crop bean in that 1120 to maybe 1135 area. Um, you know, that's where I'd probably want to start making some uh, sales there. You mentioned acres, and that's the hot topic that we're going to have something to talk about. I guess it's the hot stove league of commodities instead of baseball. Uh, in the cotton market specifically, uh, they've been on a run up pretty much all of 2020 again continued and extended this week. But are we, really, are we going to have as many co uh, cotton acres next year? Does cotton lose out in this uh, acre discussion of trying to get to 90 and 91 million acres in corn and soybeans? I, I think, you know, time will tell because uh, every cotton producer out there is looking at $11 new crop beans and, and wondering, you know, how many acres do I switch? And Cotton will have to rally. I, I mean, new crop cotton is this in, in this 73, 70 half, 73 and a half cent range. I, I think to secure and get enough acres in that cotton, I think you need to see that new crop cotton in that 78, maybe 79 cent level. Uh, old crop cotton goes to that 78 to 80 cents. I mean, the USDA has, in, in my opinion, uh, overstated this cotton crop, uh, the production and also understated the demand we've seen. We've seen excellent demand out of China here all year on the cotton. So I, I think cotton uh, makes a run in that 76, 78 cent range. Let's switch over to livestock. There's a couple of overlapping stories there, but uh, in the live cattle market specifically, uh, this has been a big change in fundamentals have been happening here recently in the last month. Taxing, packing capacity to, uh, we've had some production issues, but we've also had non-production issues like we thought we have. What's the biggest story in live cattle as we flip the calendar to 21 for you? Oh, I think it's going to be continue to be slaughter capacity. I mean, uh, the number one way to kill a livestock market or, or have prices really decline is, is slow the kill chains. Um, but, you know, you, you look beyond that, um, we're going to have some numbers to deal with here in the first January and February. I mean, it's, it's, we're going to have some big numbers to get through. But you look beyond that, you look into the first quarter of 2021, second quarter, um, the numbers are going to be pretty tight. I mean, we've had three consecutive months of 88, 89, 90% placements compared to last year. Uh, so those numbers are going to be tight. Also, the vaccine, hopefully many Americans have it by midsummer restaurants get open up and there is plenty of pent up demand. So I, I look for that cattle market uh, this summer and in April to be pretty good. I, I could see April in that 125 and in June up in that 120 area. On the feeder side, the, the feeder has a pretty heavy weight on this feed issue uh, when you talk corn price. They're gonna have to have a pretty sharp pencil to succeed in 21. Yeah, the feeders, are, I, I mean, it's gonna be difficult. Um, you know, th this corn price is definitely gonna take a chunk into there. And also, I mean, the feeders are a little bit overpriced here. I mean, you got them up here in this 140, 143 area. We're selling 112 fats here right now. So I, I think they're a little bit overdone. They, they've come a long ways off the lows that we saw three months ago. Uh, but you look at August up there at 150, uh, you know, that probably needs some downside protection there. This hog market, I can't let you go without asking about this. $3.00. 33 cents, a 5% rally. That doesn't make sense. Two month high and it's a premium to cash. So the market is telling us, you know, maybe the cash is going to come up here. I mean, it, it's at quite a premium, but huge exports in the uh, pork complex. Um, but also you look at what's in the freezer. I mean, right now we have 10 year low supply of pork in the freezer. Uh, the hog numbers, it's the first time in five years that the hog numbers are lower than the previous year obviously what we went through in the industry here. But, uh, you know, China is going to need hogs here for probably the next two to three years. Uh, you know, 
I like the June contract in this 83 cent range. If we close below 79 cents, that opens the door to lower prices. But uh, uh, I like the poor complex right now. All right, real quick in 10 seconds, the dollar, does it have much movement lower? Yes, I How think much? it does. Uh, watch it below 88, then it's going to fall off a cliff down to 83, maybe 82. But uh, yeah, the dollar looks extremely weak to me. All right. Jeff French, good to see you. Thank you so very much for the insight. Appreciate it. Great to be here. All right. That will do it for this installment of Market to Market. We will talk more in Market Plus, so you can join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. The beauty of winter may be hard for some to see, but we do find some images and share them on our Instagram feed. Make following our feed of Market to Market show as one of your resolutions in 2021. Next week, we'll look at the fight against food insecurity in the new year. Thank you so very much for watching. We'll see you later. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.